All right. Let's write it out. Uh, so my presentation tonight uh, is focused on infrastructure spending and caring for our common home, uh, with main emphasis on the recent spending proposals uh, going on in Washington uh, and how they relate to, you know, the Catholic principle of, you know, uh, that was espoused by Pope Francis and Laudato Si, that we should uh, you know, take care uh, of the earth, our common home, and those who live within it. I did a presentation around a month ago that focused uh, on the entirety of both of these spending proposals and how they related to Catholic social teaching. Uh, I'll include a link to that, and uh, as well as some other important links that I'll discuss tonight um, in the chat below as we get towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so the two bills that we'll be discussing tonight uh, are the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is referred to in the media as the Infrastructure Bill or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Um, this was passed in the Senate uh, around a month ago, at uh, the 69 to 30 vote, receiving votes from both Democratic and Republican senators. Um, it's currently awaiting passage in the House and a signature from President Biden. And uh, what this consists of is uh, one and a half trillion dollars in uh, infrastructure spending, including half a trillion of new infrastructure spending. Uh, we'll get into more of the specific provisions within this bill as we go forward. Uh, so the other bill we're going to be talking about tonight is the fiscal year 2022 budget. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the reconciliation bill, uh, which refers to the process by which uh, Democrats hope to pass this piece of legislation. Uh, to simplify it, um, this is a method of passing a bill which requires only a simple majority of votes in the Senate, uh, whereas to bypass a filibuster, a bill would normally need 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, and Democrats in the House and Senate are hoping to bypass this through reconciliation. So within this budget, there's three and a half trillion dollars of spending. Uh, this is compared to one point two nine eight trillion dollars in spending in 2021. According to the, uh, it's, it's the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, uh, which is a local budget watchdog group in Washington. And uh, we'll talk more about the individual provisions of this bill uh, as we go forward, but it contained a lot of social safety net expenditures, as well as uh, additional infrastructure spending, particularly with regards to the climate. Oh, didn't look quite. So these are some of the priorities uh, outlined by members of the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops back in April. Uh, this was particularly with regards to infrastructure spending and uh, a lot, both spending programs. Uh, some of the priorities they discussed came up in those pieces of legislation. Uh, we'll focus primarily tonight on the climate. And what they wanted to see was that, uh, you know, that this legislation and this spending contributed to constructing integral ecology in the United States. And by that, they mean uh, this is something that Pope Francis discusses mightily in uh, his encyclical Laudato Si. And, and the emphasis is that, uh, you know, our society and our world is made up of a wide variety of different systems, and that these, system needs to, these systems need to work together and cooperate uh, in order to, for there to be harmony across the world. So this can range from uh, things you know, like the environment, maintaining it, uh, ensuring that it's protected, um, to other things like ensuring that uh, the most poor and vulnerable across the world are uh, taken care of and have uh, you know, a shot at getting a decent life. So some of the priorities they discussed in this section uh, include um, very traditional infrastructure projects like investments and upgrades and transportation, energy and building infrastructure, um, not only for the economic and social benefits that that sort of thing would provide, but also because it would provide uh, a lot of jobs for uh, particularly marginalized communities and you know, provide a boost in employment for uh, sectors of the economy, like those without a college degree, uh, this type of spending would provide jobs to those folks in particular. Oop, that's someone else. Um, so like I said earlier, this legislation um, that they said in their letter, uh, it should keep in mind the least of these. Um, those who are the most vulnerable to climate change, those who are most vulnerable to uh, the ebbs and flows of the economy. That is what they were really looking for in these pieces of legislation. Um, and that includes both infrastructure, climate policy, and social spending that they were looking for. 
uh, like I kind of hinted at earlier, um, they wanted to see that a lot of jobs were created, particularly for those who work in industries uh, that over the next few decades, as we try to end our reliance on fossil fuels like oil, coal, natural gas, uh, that, that uh, we ensured that those who would be unemployed by the decline of those industries, that they are able to find work and transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, so this can manifest, we'll talk about a little bit uh, later, you know, job retraining programs, uh, uh, whether it be, you know, finding work in other energy sectors or outside of the sector entirely, um, ensuring that communities that relied on these types of industries don't completely collapse like the boom and bust towns of the past. Uh, and so that as we try to move away from carbon uh, based infrastructure, um, the people who are involved in that sort of industry are not left behind. Uh, so now we'll go into the specific programs, provisions, and projects that are included in both of these bills. Uh, we'll first start, uh, oh, so originally back in, I think, March, uh, both of these programs, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Reconciliation Bill that we'll talk about later, they were included in this one catch-all program called the American Jobs and Families Plan. Um, and these are two wonderful graphics from the New York Times depicting what was in the bill originally and what's in it now. Uh, so the one on the left is the original proposal for the bill. Uh, and the one on the right is the current bipartisan infrastructure plan that passed the Senate last month. Uh, so in the original plan, it was all going to be enveloped together, the social safety net spending, uh, as you can see on this chart, uh, research and development manufacturing funding, um, you know, home and community-based care. A lot of this stuff was things like uh, tuition-free community college, improved access to daycares uh, for families, um, it paid family and sick leave, uh, these sorts of programs that they wanted to go for to improve the social safety net of the United States. Uh, and then things on the right you'll see are the, the more traditional, uh, what we would traditionally associate with infrastructure projects. So this includes things like uh, building up broadband, uh, getting clean water infrastructure, building up our ports and waterways, these sorts of things. But as you can see in the current bipartisan infrastructure plan, uh, a lot of things, these things were cut out. The social safety net spending was entirely cut out and is instead now in the reconciliation bill. Uh, but a lot of the uh, traditional infrastructure spending uh, components of the bill were whittled down as well, which happens in negotiations. Um, but a lot of things were drastically cut, like uh, funding for electrical vehicle infrastructure was pretty drastically cut from $157 billion to $15 billion. Uh, reconnecting communities, which I'll get more into later, that was cut from $24 billion to $1 billion. And clean energy tax credits were completely erased from the bipartisan infrastructure plan, uh, you know, giving incentives to companies um, not only to build clean energy infrastructure, but also to use it. But that being said, even with these cuts, the bill is pretty gigantic in terms of, uh, you know, what we've spent in the past in terms of infrastructure spending. So like I said earlier, this bill uh, passed in the Senate with flying colors, 69 to 30. Um, this received votes from uh, 50 Democratic senators or Democratic aligned senators. Uh, and 19 Republican senators. And uh, I know not all of y'all are from North Carolina, but uh, for all my North Carolinians out there, both Senator Tom Tillis and Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina voted yes on this legislation. Uh, so included, as I said earlier, uh, is one and a half trillion dollars in infrastructure spending, uh, which includes 550 billion in new federal spending. So these are new projects, uh, additional maintenance fees, um, things to get our infrastructure built back to, you know, a better standard. Uh, so among this new federal spending, around a fifth is dedicated to, uh, uh, you know, repairing roads, bridges, and related projects, um, building new bridges where they're needed. A lot of our bridges in this country are uh, dilapidated or over, um, you know, overdue for repairs. Um, and, you know, improving our roads, uh, you know, basic transportation infrastructure is what they're going for there. Uh, $65 billion has been assigned for broadband expansion, which I alluded to earlier. Uh, in their letter, the bishops um, 
uh, specifically sought out funding for broadband expansion. This is primarily because in the 21st century, in order to compete, uh, you know, when Arian needs high speed internet um, to compete uh, economically, so they have, uh, you know, better access to the internet in the global markets. Uh, and what they were looking for here is, uh, you know, improving internet access, high speed internet access, more specifically to uh, rural areas. Uh, impoverished urban areas. So they had, you know, a leg to stand on when compared to wealthier urban areas or uh, suburban areas that have had access to high speed internet for quite a while now. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, $1 billion has been dedicated to reconnecting communities divided by highways. So what they're talking about here is uh, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, a great number of communities across the United States. Um, I'm sure many of you have noticed, or at least know about this, uh, if you're driving through the Northeast on 95, uh, for example, or driving in any part of the country, um, a lot of interstate highways tend to go straight through cities rather than around them. And when those highways were built through those cities, they destroyed a great number of communities, particularly communities uh, that were impoverished or otherwise didn't have the political clout to battle the construction of these freeways. So that money uh, seeks to reconnect these communities either by burying highways, diverting them, or otherwise reducing their impacts and going into programs in those cities that, you know, sort of ameliorate the effects that highways have had on a lot of these places. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, $55 billion for clean water infrastructure in the main uh, focus of this is replacing the lead pipes uh, that unfortunately remain in a lot of places throughout the United States. Um, there is no healthy amount of lead in a human being, and getting rid of these lead pipes uh, would go a long way in reducing the amount of lead, uh, you know, that people have in their bloodstream. Um, uh, you know, particularly in a lot of uh, impoverished areas uh, in the Northeast and industrial areas, California has a particularly nasty uh, problem with lead pipes. Uh, you know, across the country, there's a severe problem. And this money would uh, go to reducing that problem and replacing those pipes. Uh, now we'll move on to the specifically climate related funding that was in the infrastructure bill. Uh, as you saw in that comparison of the before and after, a lot of the climate related uh, funding was unfortunately cut and is now in the reconciliation bill, but this is some of the stuff that continued uh, in the bill. Uh, so there's $7.5 billion for electric vehicle infrastructure. And what this primarily is, uh, it's building up chargers in areas. Uh, so right now, if you own an electric vehicle, uh, there are certain areas in the country you cannot go to because these areas lack sufficient, uh, you know, charging infrastructure to get you in and out of that area safely, uh, you know, without basically breaking down on the side of the highway. Uh, so this money is dedicated primarily to that and improving chargers, uh, you know, in rural areas or in sort of charger deserts, uh, as well as uh, building more of them in urban areas. Uh, $7.5 billion is being dedicated to electrifying buses and ferries. Uh, part of the big goal of this is to reduce urban pollution. So if you go into a downtown of a city like, say, New York, there are tons of buses and uh, public transportation is fantastic for the environment because it gets uh, cars and trucks off the road and instead gets people into a bus. And, you know, uh, that individual bus emits less, uh, less uh, carbon emissions than, you know, if, say, there's like 50 people in a bus. Um, none of them are driving a car if they're in that bus. So it reduces emissions in that way. Uh, primarily what they wanna do with this funding is electrify buses. So uh, these are large vehicles that still emit you know, gas fumes, um, but electrifying them would get rid of that problem and help clean up the air in our urban areas, particularly dense urban areas where there are a lot of buses. Uh, and it's a similar thing from ferries. It's just reducing the amount of local pollution even if uh, you know, buses and ferries are charged, um, carrying electrical charge from power plants that aren't necessarily carbon friendly, electrifying buses and ferries will at least improve the local air quality of these cities and towns. So uh, uh, somewhat related, $28 billion has been dedicated to power grid improvements. So this can range for anything to uh, improving clean energy infrastructure. So 
uh, connecting more solar, wind, and hydroelectric to the grid. Um, a lot of this is in fish, uh, efficiency improvements. So even if we do have fossil fuel energy production, it's getting to where it needs to go uh, quicker and more of it is getting there rather than being lost throughout the uh, power grid system. Uh, and some of this is being uh, dedicated to uh, improving uh, you know, the weather resistance of our power grid infrastructure. So uh, months ago back in the winter when Texas had that terrific uh, ice storm and snowstorm and that cold snap, uh, where the power grid of Texas effectively failed for millions of people. They didn't have heat during, you know, record-breaking low temperatures. This funding would go to, you know, preventing that type of thing from happening in the future, especially as, uh, you know, weather events become more extreme and more frequent. Uh, so, you know, similar to, you know, mitigating the effects of those types of things on our power grid, $46 billion has been dedicated to, uh, climate catastrophe mitigation in general. So this can range from anything from sea level rise, uh, you know, you know, intercontinental, uh, intracontinental flooding from rivers and lakes that break their banks uh, to things like uh, you know, wildfire remediation and mitigation, these sorts of things. Uh, I've depicted there to the right is a, um, an image of the Embarcadero seawall in San Francisco. And, you know, uh, we'll need funding for these types of projects, particularly as weather events grow more extreme and sea levels continue to rise. Uh, so uh, what this funding will do is trying to, you know, mitigate the effects, the worst effects of a lot of climate catastrophes that are heading our way. Uh, $28 billion um, will be dedicated to environmental re remediation. So in the negotiations for the bipartisan infrastructure plan, this was one of the few things that increased uh, in the amount of money it received. So this is uh, repairing sites that have been affected by toxic waste or other types of pollution, you know, things like coal mines, um, places where a lot of chemicals were used uh, either for mining operations or industrial practices. This is repairing those types of environments and uh, if not making them safe for human habitation, at least making them less toxic for the surrounding areas. Uh, like I know now in New York, uh, there's a project going on at the Gowanus Canal, which is a you know, famously just filthy area of the city um, with a lot of environmental damage. And you know, funding like this could go to repairing places like that and building them up. So uh, you know, if not even humans could live there, at least they're not poisoning the surrounding residents is the goal. Uh, and then 39 billion is being dedicated to public transit infrastructure. I, I alluded to this earlier that, you know, this kind of funding is very good for getting people out of cars uh, around uh, the figures 29%, according to the EPA, that's, that's the amount of our emissions come from transportation. And a lot of that comes uh, from cars. So if individuals, uh, so let's say in a city that, you know, 90% of your people are driving by car, uh, you know, particularly in a lot of American cities, people are driving alone. Uh, so that's one car on every road, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, gas powered cars that are emitting those carbon, uh, you know, emitting those greenhouse gases that are warming the planet. Uh, public transit infrastructure takes people off the road and out of their cars and puts them in more efficient modes of transportation. So like I said earlier, a bus full of 50 people is more environmentally efficient than uh, you know fifty individual cars going down the highway, and you know this has the added benefit of reducing congestion in our cities. Now we'll move on to the fiscal year twenty twenty two budget, also known as the reconciliation bill. Uh, like I said before, this is like the entire federal budget of the United States for the next year, and as a result, is a very diverse bill. Um, this includes, you know, everything from the military to housing and urban development, uh, you know, and everything in between. Uh, so this features around $3.5 trillion in federal spending, uh, of which I believe $2 trillion is new. Um, this is compared to the $1.2 trillion budget from a couple of years ago or last year. Um, while this bill has passed neither in the House or the Senate, a framework is has passed uh, the House and the Senate along party line votes. Uh, in the House, it was the uh, vast majority of Democrats voted in favor and all Republicans voted against. 
whereas in the Senate, uh, all Democrats voted in favor and the Republicans voted against. So this is a very uh, you know, contentious piece of legislation, but it also contains uh, a lot of individual provisions uh, that would go a long way in improving the United States' environmental impact. Uh, so firstly, we'll look at the individual budget provisions within the legislation, and I got this from a, a memorandum that was sent out to Democratic senators earlier this year. I've included a link to that uh, in the bundle of links that I'll send out uh, at the end. Uh, so some of the individual provisions include uh, agriculture, conservation, drought, uh, drought, and forestry programs to help reduce carbon emissions and prevent wildfires. So. Uh, uh, another fairly large um, producer of carbon emissions in the United States, particularly the United States, uh, which has a, a large section dedicated to, ag to agriculture, uh, is agricultural production. And the funding from these programs would uh, allow farms to be more efficient uh, and agriculture in general to be more efficient, uh, particularly, you know, livestock raising, which is a large source of pollution as well. Um, and preventing wildfires is also a pretty critical thing with regards to climate change as you know extreme weather events become more severe and with them wildfires become more severe. Uh, the budget also includes funding for a new civilian climate core, which would employ uh, thousands of people. And uh, if you're familiar with the history of the New Deal back in the 30s, uh, this would look similar to the Civilian Conservation Corps of that time. Uh, this would focus primarily on the climate, uh, you know, doing things like the Civilian Conservation Corps did like planting trees and building parks, uh, but also improving uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, particularly in rural areas, um, in wilderness areas to prevent wildfires and to help mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, included in this bill is a whole host of in, uh, improved climate research funding. So a large part that was cut out of the original American Jobs and Families Plan was spending for research and development. And uh, within the Bishop's letter uh, concerning infrastructure spending and federal spending in general, uh, they made a pretty, uh, you know, they made specific references to improving research and development in the United States. And uh, within Laudato Si, Pope Francis says uh, something along the lines of, it's not enough to merely uh, do the best that we can right now, but we also need to look for what are the best practices going forward and what can we do in the future to even uh, you know, further reduce our impact on the environment. And this improved climate, uh, you know, climate research funding would not only go to studying the effects of climate change, but also uh, researching new methods uh, of how we get out of this crisis and how we further reduce our impact on the environment. Uh, other funding will go to rural development and rural co-op clean energy investments. Uh, you know, this kind of goes hand in hand with the rural broadband programs uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure plan. Uh, so not only improving, uh, you know, the access of rural folks to a high speed internet, but also improving access to clean energy uh, clean, uh, cheaper clean energy going forward. Uh, this also includes more funding for coastal resiliency, kind of like the seawalls that I was mentioning earlier, uh, ensuring that our coastlines are safe and secure, uh, especially given that a, you know, a, a fairly significant portion of the American population uh, resides fairly close to the coastline. Uh, and this also includes Increase funding for the National Oceans and Coastal Security Fund. So building up those bulwarks against rising sea levels or hurricanes or any, uh, any sort of disaster uh, you know, that comes from the sea. There was also a pretty significant amount of funding in the fiscal year 2022 budget with regards to jobs. Uh, I mentioned the Civilian Conservation Corps funding earlier, but there was also uh, you know, that R&D development is very important to generating jobs. Uh, particularly in hard hit areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, economic development, and there's a little bit there about the Appalachian Regional Commission uh, and the Economic Development Administration. Uh, that's what I was talking about earlier with regards to job training and these sorts of programs that are necessary in regions, uh, you know, that are impacted by the loss of the fossil fuel industry, but the people there remain and they need, you know, they need jobs going forward. They need to take care of themselves. So this funding uh, would ensure that 
people are able to, you know, if not seamlessly, but of, you know, more smoothly uh, transition from, you know, the fossil fuel industry over to uh, a new sector of employment. Uh, and, you know, similar to job creation, uh, you know, directly related is financing for domestic manufacturing of clean energy and auto supply chain technologies. Uh, what this focuses on is, you know, building windmills in the United States, building solar, solar panels in the United States, uh, you know, electric vehicles, building them in the United States and, you know, their chargers and all of that. Uh, what, what that hopes to do is ensure that uh, American jobs are created in order to facilitate this transition over to a, a more cleaner energy uh, based future. There was also a pretty significant part of this budget uh, focused on housing. There was another letter uh, from the bishops, uh, particularly focusing on housing and uh, what programs needed to be uh, included in order to ensure that everyone uh, uh, was able to access uh, an affordable and stable home. So uh, what, what they wanted to do uh, in this budget was create and preserve affordable housing, uh, particularly in a lot of American cities. I'm sure if you've watched the news, you know that there is a, a affordable housing crisis across the United States. Uh, regardless of where you are in the country, there is simply not enough housing uh, for the amount of people that need it. And uh, what, what, what they sought in the budget when they were crafting it and what the bishops were seeking was, in addition to building more housing, is ensuring that the housing that gets built uh, is affordable to working people across the country. Um, so, you know, investing in things like the Housing Trust Fund, Home, uh, Capital Magnet Fund, and Rural Housing, Capital Magnet Fund, you know, attracting uh, monetary resources two areas that are previously depressed, like rural areas and impoverished inner city neighborhoods, you know, uh, making their economy more competitive with the rest of the country. And related to that, uh, they, uh, the budget seeks uh, to increase community investment, uh, development and revitalization uh, through initiatives like the Community Land Trust, which uh, allows uh, people in a community that otherwise would not be able to afford housing. What they do is they uh, these community land trusts buy up land, build housing on the land, and then sell it below market rate and help people you know, build up equity so they can own a home and have those resources in the future. Uh, investments in community development block grants, which allows uh, for community improvements, like anything from you know, painting murals uh, to improve an area, uh, building sidewalks, improving local roads, uh, you know, building lights, these sorts of things that make a community more welcoming and more hospitable for the people who live there. Uh, they also sought uh, improvements in zoning and land use practices, ensuring that density is increased where density needs to be increased, uh, particularly in areas near employment um, and along transit infrastructure. So in Washington, D.C., if you look at a satellite image uh, of the city and you follow uh, as you go out from downtown, you can see a very clear pattern of where the subway lines and, uh, you know, important bus lines are in the city because there will be, you know, uh, larger buildings and more apartments in those areas. And that's a result of a practice called transit oriented development, which allows for higher density developments next to transit. And that's kind of what they were going for in this budget is trying to improve uh, these sorts of practices so that there's more housing where there needs to be more housing. Uh, along transit infrastructure, um, and especially ensuring that a lot of that housing is affordable, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, by, by ensuring, you know, through the practice of what's called inclusionary zoning, in which uh, certain amounts of a building are dedicated to affordable housing or uh, dedicated so uh, certain people below a certain income bracket can afford to live there. Uh, these are the kinds of things they're looking for to improve access uh, and improve the health of our cities. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, with the infrastructure spending in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, transit improvements are a very important part of this, uh, both in terms of housing and taking care of the climate and creating that healthy and sustainable housing. So, you know, denser, uh, denser housing in particular uh, to reduce uh, suburban sprawl, which has had fairly devastating impacts on the environment, not only through 
construction of vast quantities of very low density housing on old farmland or green fields or forests or wherever else they needed to build it. Um, by building denser, we have reduced those impacts. And we also uh, reduced the amount of uh, distance that people need to travel within the cities, uh, which would reduce the carbon impact of driving uh, over long distances. Uh, so as we get to the end here, I, I wanted to end by saying like, hey, what, 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 how do we do, um, what do we do going forward? Uh, so if you followed the news recently, right now in particular, there's a lot of debate uh, going on about the order in which the bills are passed, how they are going to pass, whether or not they should even pass at all. And uh, going forward, how do we ensure that the priorities of the church with regards to um, the environment and social spending in general, how, how do we ensure that they do go forward and that those uh, priorities get fulfilled? Um, and and as, as this goes forward, the probably most effective thing that we as individuals can do is contact our representatives and you know, share our piece and speak our mind about these sort of things. So I'll include this link uh, in the document that I'll include in the, I'll post in the chat in a few minutes. Uh, but this will help you find your representative. Maybe you've uh, found them already. Maybe you know who your representative is, but this will also point you towards uh, their phone number and contact information, the website for their offices. And this will help you uh, contact your representatives and your senators as well to tell them, you know, maybe if you're more hesitant about the reconciliation bill, uh, maybe just tell them what in particular uh, you want to see done going forward, even if that bill does, uh, in particular doesn't pass, you know seeing improved investments in climate infrastructure in particular, so that we can uh, better take care of our common home. Uh, so that was it. Um, I thank you all for joining me here tonight. Um, this was you know, a very fascinating thing to learn about. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a poli sci and urban planning student. So you know, infrastructure spending is very, you know, very interesting to me, but uh, thank you all for attending tonight. And uh, if you do have any questions, um, uh, you can ask them and I'll, I'll try my best to answer them. I don't know everything about uh, infrastructure spending in this country, but I will, I will try my best. And I think Deacon Josh wanted to add something as well. I saw him unmute there for a second. No, that's good. I was just going to ask if you were going to have any questions. I was just going to uh, say a great, great presentation, really thorough. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Uh, and just a reminder to everybody, you know, why why we do this. It's always it's always important to uh, contact our representatives and develop a relationship with them. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to do that. Um, also, don't forget the city, city council, uh, your your state senators, um, because they, they actually have a lot of influence over the um, things going on in, in the uh, immediate area. So um, it's always good to develop a relationship with them. Um, besides, also in North Carolina, we don't have a, um, a conference of bishops in North Carolina. So you're generally not going to hear anything coming from the uh, diocese or from the bishops. So it's important for you as Catholics to uh, develop that relationship with Jesus, form your conscience, um, and then you know take that to your political representatives. And, and you're not going to – I don't expect to see anything from the uh, – from North Carolina because we don't have a conference of Catholic bishops. Um, so with that, just just keep the keep the gospel at the center. And make sure you uh, tell them about you know the joy that Jesus provides to you in your life, and that's why we uh, that's why we do care for creation. Um, I just want to add you know two quote two of my favorite quotes that kind of capture that. Why do Christians care about the environment? The first comes from uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who says uh, who said in Caritas et, in at Veritate that the way humanity treats the environment influence influences the way it treats itself and vice versa. And uh, that goes right into what the early church fathers would say. Uh, one of my favorite St. Maximus, the confessor says, it is according to whether we use things rightly or wrongly that we become good or bad. So, so basically, uh, you know, God, God has given us creation. God's given us new life uh, in a new relationship with him. And so inspired with that love and that joy, um, we have a responsibility to take care of um all of his creation and how we treat his creation is how we treat ourselves so abusing abusing the environment abusing creation we abuse ourselves and we abuse others um and, and it does immense damage uh, spiritually as well as physically so uh th that's all i wanted to say and then uh, pass it over um to anybody who has questions for michael michael 
Michael, I just wonder, uh, thanks very much for this. This is a, a lot of useful information. <clears throat> can you can you tell me the time frame in which those billions and trillions are being spent? It's not all next year, I know, but uh, is it 10 years? Is, you know, how is it, what's the, the spending horizon? Uh, so um, from what I've seen uh, in the coverage of the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation package, um, the spending horizon uh, seems to be over the next decade. Um, so, like you said, not spent all in 2022, but investments over a longer period of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. Oh, um, I just saw a question in the chat uh, uh, about, um, I will be, uh, I have been recording uh, this presentation. Hopefully the recording worked properly. Um, but if it was, I will uh, upload it probably to Google Drive and generate a link for it and uh, send it out uh, to the folks who uh, registered for this event in case they want to either watch it in the future or uh, share it with those around them. Um, I, had, I do have a question, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Course. And this is not necessarily specifically for you, Michael, because I'm sure that Deacon Josh and many of the folks here could probably speak to this. And I acknowledge I'm kind of like taking a little bit of a risk here by even asking this question because I represent, I'm i here with the USCCB. So it's kind of an interesting question to ask, but the USCCB has come out in favor of certain policies within the, the infrastructure spending bill. And that might not sit well with other Catholics. Like there might be Catholics, even in this particular chat room right now, um, I certainly know some that they might not feel like this is the right way to live out Laudato Si or this is the right policy or whatever. Do you kind of get what I'm saying here? Yeah. So I guess my question is like, what do we do with that? Like how... How should Catholics who maybe don't necessarily agree with the policy positions of the USCCB on certain issues uh, and issues of prudential judgment? I'm not talking about like issues of like, this is an objective moral norm, like abortion or marriage or whatever. Like um, we're talking about things when it comes to the environment, this is a prudential judgment area. So how do we deal with that kind of tension? I don't know. This is, again, I'm not trying to put you in the hot seat specifically, Michael, but I just kind of wanted to open that dialogue here, if anybody has thoughts about that. I, you know, I think that's a great question. Uh, it's one that certainly comes up a lot. Uh, you know, the American Catholic Church is unfortunately very divided and that, you know, climate change and how to deal with it effectively, you know, that's one of the big dividing issues. And uh, I think one of the core problems is that, um, you know, uh, the two sides of this debate, those who want to, you know, uh, use the government as a tool, uh, solving climate change, you know, see climate change as a problem. And those who do not, you know, there's a deep philosophical divide and, uh, you know, people on both sides of that aisle tend not to talk to each other. Um, and I think, you know, if we all pigeonhole ourselves into different communities of like a sort of ideological purity, I think it hurts a lot of us, uh, especially when it comes to issues like this, like the climate, uh, crisis is a very big deal and a very big emergency. Um, and I think we need to come together and find some conclusion over how to resolve it, uh, whether it be through gigantic infrastructure packages like this or by other means. But how to you know, bridge that gulf in particular effectively. I mean, I'm a poli-sci student and I study that pretty much, uh, or I've been studying that for the past four years, and I don't think I'm any closer to really understanding how to do that. Well, I'm yeah. just gonna say, I'm a grandmother, and everything with climate, I look through the lens of my grandchildren, because they're, what we're doing right now, they're gonna have to live in. And I, anybody that's going to question anything we do right now to help the climate, I asked them, are you a grandparent? Are you our parent? I mean, we love families, right? That's what Catholics do. What kind of world do you want to leave your family? That's the, that's the approach I would take. 
Yeah, I, I would say I wouldn't get it. I would not make it a political issue. This is a this is a, a life issue, personally. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think we gotta uh, not make it partisan, and I think the best way to do that is is again, like I say, get to know your local politicians and find find where you do agree. That's what I would say, Sarah. Like, um, uh, and maybe not to work on the grand you know scope of everything, but Michael talked about a lot of great things that both sides can agree on. Um, myself, I'm represented by a guy named Richard Hudson, who's extremely uh, conservative, great guy. Um, but but we definitely agree on not polluting the waterways, and he's he's made a lot of strong environmental stances, and he sees himself as an ally to the environment, um, despite the um, the partisanship you see. So um, you, you could uh, unite with people over those issues instead of just saying, in general, um, are we going to provide funding? But we could look at a lot of the things that Michael talked about in the slideshow and say, OK, look, let's talk about something concrete like and whatever that is and find that electric cars. And then real quick, as, as I do this with as you brought up abortion, same way we can get all partisan on that. But if we talk about supporting moms in need. Uh, nobody disagrees with that. Nobody's going to say, well, no, let's just leave them sitting out in the cold. That's ridiculous. We can work together on on things. And so find those things that we agree with with the environment as well, because uh, you will find common ground as long as we're not uh, talking about you know political philosophy. There's one other resource that I don't know that uh, the government is really using, and that's this book called Drawdown. Um, if any of you are uh, not familiar with this book, this tells you exactly lays out what best practices are and what things we should be doing and addressing. Like refrigeration is the number one thing for pollutant and, and warming the atmosphere. And that's, I mean, it's not even in the, any of these bills. If you look through them, there's not even a word mentioned about it. You can educate your legislators about some of the issues that Drawdown um, highlights is the things that, you know, educating girls is a huge one. Um, so that would be that would be a big step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I have a question that's kind of different, but as some of you said you were Laudato C advocates. I'm a Laudato C animator with the Laudato C movement. What is the, uh, who is doing the Laudato C advocates? What organization is doing that? Anybody? If you want, go ahead, Michael. Probably. Okay. Um, so let's dot to see advocates. I'm an intern uh, and there's two things. There's the interns and the advocates. Uh, and the advocates uh, work with the organization Creatio. Uh, and a lot of their focus is on um, sort of, uh, I guess step in if I'm wrong, Sarah, but it's it's focused on you know advocating for certain policies uh, that would improve uh, you know our treatment of the environment. Um, so kind of like uh, what Deacon Josh was talking about earlier, you know, improving waterways, uh, you know, and getting the policy passed um, that would allow for that to happen, or uh, you know, writing letters to the editor in local newspapers to spread the word about environmental advocacy, or um, in the future. Um, of writing op-eds or doing things like this, like advocacy meetings, talking about that sort of thing. Yeah, the Laudato Sea Advocates Program is an internship for students and graduate students, and it's co-administered by the USCCB, Creatio, and NRPE, which is the National Religious Partnership on the Environment. So it's kind of a conglomerate program that we have for younger people to raise up young Catholics to advocate on these issues. Oh. And to just, I mean, a little bit Sarah's question, like do we would say the first thing we probably is prayer when people always talk about any, any topic, right? Almost that's what you, you hear. Um, but a little bit to Josh's point, uh, Deacon Josh, is that sometimes it's about trying to find a question, you know, that, that people can talk about. And I think, you know, it, um, you know, you just, I mean, to two, two little things is sometimes you say farming and we've heard in North Carolina, you know, maybe there's, you know, from a long time ago, there was issues, you know, with say hog farming or something. And, and we've, you know, this is a hog farm state, you know, um, and, and in a lot of these things, you are trying to have to balance like both sides of an issue. You know, it's, it's, you, you want farming, you want economy, all this other stuff. And you're also trying to save the waterways and everything like that. And so 
you know, one like for most of us, have I ever talked to a farmer in North Carolina? I probably have sometimes, but have I gotten into these topics? No, you know, and so it, uh, it does mean whether it's your senators or, you know, farmers or other people. And uh, I mean, the other example, another thing is, is sort of, I think our, our family had bought a uh, hybrid car over 10 years ago. And that's, and we got like a 2010 Ford Fusion hybrid, which was the first year that that even came out. And we sort of, in a sense, people tell you don't buy the first year of a car anyway, but we did. And it was good, even though it's, it got in a wreck and it's gone. But um, when we got that, the real question was, is will this take off or not? Like, will this become the real trend? And even though in some places, in some urban areas, it seems like it has, Overall, when you look around on the highways and byways or something over, and even though there's a lot of vehicles now, even like SUVs that are hybrids and stuff like that, overall, when you look at most vehicles, it hasn't really taken off. And, and I mean, electric cars have started, but it's like um, right now that hasn't necessarily taken off, even though it's, tr it's trying to, in a sense. And so it, it is, a you know, but then, did we do any research of like what hybrids and where these batteries come from? And I'll like, no, you know, and again, you have to do research. You have to talk to people and find out. And is like, is these, and once I learned about these hybrid batteries, it was almost like, what are we going to do with these things? Cause you know, eventually, you know, they're going to get in, get in a landfill or something. And so it, there, these things, like I said, none of these things is great topics to talk about because none of these things are really, 100% like black and white, you know, and perfect, uh, uh, a one-sided thing. And that's why I think prayer comes back to, to all these things. And, and as I, when I talked to um, some people that were coming around here in Chapel Hill, talking about one of the new mayors that's running, and I had told them that overall that candidate to me had most logic and common sense, but did I gr agree with her on every issue? There was no way, you know, and that's sort of, any of us on this call, we're not going to agree on every every issue, and uh, and a lot of it is trying, like I said, trying to find a balance uh, in the world to to as we're trying to improve the world, like I said, and leave our the world a better place. Um, but it, it's it isn't all. That's why I said you got to pray about stuff a lot of times, you know, and pray about you know whether it's our representatives and uh, and uh, and even Pope Francis and stuff like that. Because uh, in general, is everybody trying to help? Probably, yeah. You know, Pope Francis is trying to help. The legislators are trying to help everyone. Um, but like I said, just praying about a lot of these issues and for about these people, because uh, these things sometimes aren't 100 percent like one sided, you know. So prayer. <laughs> yeah, spot on. Exactly. So you got a couple more minutes, Michael, if you have any if you want to entertain any more questions. Sure. If, uh, if anybody else has any. Uh, questions or anything to add? Let me check that chat real quick because I saw some messages, but I don't think there is any more questions. Yeah, it's so about the recording. But um, if nobody else has any more questions, uh, it was very nice meeting y'all. It was a fantastic evening, and uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you. Nice presentation. Thanks, yeah, great, Michael. Great job, Michael. Awesome. God bless. Michael. Peace, everybody. Yeah, God bless. Take care, Deacon. Bye-bye. See y'all. God bless.